Okay. Uh, evidently, there's a question about one of the problems. Um, well, probably more than just one. But uh, if I explain this one, maybe it'll help on some of the other ones because it's actually uh, the, the sticky part on this problem, the one that Alan asked about, is not really, well, hopefully, it's not really setting up the physics. It's solving the problem once you've got the equation set up. So it's the problem where uh, we're given that there's a 50 meter bluff and a ship twelve kilometers away. Not to scale. And you're to determine given a muzzle velocity of six hundred meters per second. At what angle should you fire that shot so that you can indeed then hit the, the, the USS Hudson Valley Community College? Or what shooting for? Right? That's the problem. I got all those little pieces right. So this is like any other projectile motion problem in that you've got some horizontal stuff going on and some vertical stuff going on and you need to put those together to figure out what you've got and what you don't have. Um, so to, uh, to, to avoid belaboring it too much, remember that the velocity is constant. You sort of know that. You know that it's 600 meters per second cosine theta, but you don't know what theta is in this problem. In fact, that's what you're supposed to find. Well, given that, let's see, you know that this distance it needs to go in the x direction, which you're given as 12 kilometers or 12,000 meters, is that x dot times the amount of time it was in the air, which you also don't need, no. So right now there's there's two things you don't know. Really only one equation because we put this equation in there and then this becomes one equation with two unknowns. But with uh, with horizontal or with a projectile motion you can always go over to the other side and see what else you know. Y double, the acceleration is that due to gravity. Uh, what's the minus sign mean? Well, gravity is, of course gravity is downward. What's the minus sign mean? That I chose that direct, I chose positive upwards. This is an artificial construct on my part. Whatever G is, well, God fixed that whenever he got to that. I don't remember which day it was. Um, I called it sick that day. Alright, then uh, what else do we know vertically? Well, we know it needs to drop 50 meters. So delta y is negative 50. To match that negative. If you don't want to do a negative on those, don't. Just be consistent. Uh, let's see, what else, well, we, uh, oh, we, we sort of know the initial velocity. Sort of know, because it's like the same thing with the velocity over here. We know it's 600 meters per second sine theta, but we don't know what theta is. That's what we're still looking for. So this is this is kind of like a the three things you know. Kind of because uh, we don't actually know this initial velocity, we don't actually know that angle, so it's kind of like, but if we use that one equation, 
delta y equals minus one half g t squared. Delta y we know, t we don't, plus y dot i t. y dot i we sort of know, t we don't. But if you put everything you know in here, and everything you know in here, you get two equations, two unknowns. So that's one equation. That will be one equation too, and they both have the same unknown. The same unknowns. Both are T and theta unknowns. So you can put those two together, and when you do, you get an equation that might look something like this. Maybe your algebra is a little bit different, but this is what mine happened to look like. I got an equation that looked like, uh, sorry, when I put everything together, I had minus 1899 over cosine squared theta. That, that 1899 is just combinations of the 600 and the G and the 50 and however it shook out algebraically. Um, then I had 12,000, obviously that's the X dimension, tan theta equals minus 50. That's what I did when I put those two equations together, eliminating t. I chose to eliminate t because we weren't asked for it. So I don't want to eliminate theta. That's just going to make more work for myself. So I had that as my one equation, one unknown, once I put these two together to eliminate t. Then the question becomes, well, how do you solve that equation? There's a couple different ways. Um, one of my brighter math students last year pointed out it can be just solved directly. Since I'm not a brighter math student, I had to do something different. What I did with it is I took this side and I graphed it. Graphed, uh, yeah, I have the graph theta across there, and then this is some function of theta. No, I don't want y. I use an f. This is some function of theta. And I just graph the left hand side. Just, I, I put it in a spreadsheet, picked theta in a couple different sp spots and just graphed it. Actually, it comes out like this. Looks fairly linear. This happened to be about 9.1. This happened to be about minus 65 or something. Just That's just where the numbers came out. That's not what I cared about. What I cared about is when did this side that I just graphed equal minus 50? So I went to the graph at minus 50. Went to my line. That's, remember, the left-hand side of the equation. Just, just put it in Excel and graphed it. And then that's the theta at which I want to shoot the angle. So setting up to get to here is, is fairly straightforward. I just found solving this a little bit more difficult. Here's one way to do it. I, I don't know, I like graphical things. I'm a visual person, I guess. So that was just an easy way for me to solve it. But like I said, somebody else last year solved that directly. Good for him. So Alan, 
did, did you have something like this and then we're just having trouble shaking out the beta? Exactly. Yeah. Look at this kind of technique where it doesn't matter what, if any time you have a function with one variable, think about the possibility of graphing it if you can't solve it some other way. It's a little bit of a brute force technique and sometimes you have to be careful because uh, it didn't happen here. But you can certainly have an equation that has two values and it may not be obvious which is the value that works. Maybe both do. I don't know if everybody noticed that one thing about these projectile motion problems, especially when the angle is of some kind of variable possibility, is that there are um, often two solutions for these. We can shoot at kind of a low angle, get to it there. We can also shoot at a higher angle and get to it in that way, depending upon what that launch velocity is. It doesn't work with this one because this one is already set with a particular magnitude, 600 meters per second. All right, that help? Okay, so uh, if you want to work on that, if you want to turn in the homework tomorrow, that's fine. If you could use a little bit more time. I think there was one other problem that you need to kind of brute force solve like this too, where setting up the projectile wasn't the hard part, it was then making the solution work from the hard part, or, or from the subjective part. Also, don't forget, put questions on angel, right? Did that work? Did you get my response? I responded yeah. to your question. I was that last night, but I just wanted to keep on I practically gave it to you. I Uh, do not, do not work on a problem, a single problem for hours. That's a waste of your time. I don't have one single problem I can assign that's worth hours. None of them are that important. All of them together are worth a couple hours, but that's a whole homework assignment. One single problem, not worth it. Work on it for a little bit. If you get to some place where you're stuck and you're stuck for... 15 minutes, stop. It's not worth it. It's not worth your time after that. That's a waste of your time. Now, you're young and dopey and goofy and have all kinds of time to waste. That's why we have spring break in Daytona Beach. But you don't have hours to waste, I don't think, especially in the middle of the term. So work 15 minutes. Put a question on Angel. I check it every couple hours. It is... So I'm having trouble connecting from home to the school, but I can get Angel. So put a question on there, go on to something else. Spend your time better. Mike. Can we go over to grade six? Uh, I can maybe say something about it quick, but we've got to go on to new material. Oh, okay. just gonna, we're going to have to spend extra time here. Uh, Joe's the expert on that one. Isn't that the one I told you about? All right. I'll, I'll help you with this one real quick. This is the one where a plane is flying in a, in a sort of a crosswind. All right. I believe it said the wind is coming from 45 degrees. The wind is blowing 45 degrees south uh, of west, which... I took it to mean that's where it comes from because I think that's how they talk about the wind. But it doesn't matter if you if you get the right idea, that's fine. Oh, blowing from a direction, 45 degrees north of west. So it's doing that. That's the wind speed. The intended trip by the plane is pilot wishes to fly due north. If the pilot flies due north in that wind, the wind's going to blow him sideways. 
That's just what wind does to planes. And he's going to really end up doing this. His, his plane will be facing like that, but the wind will be blowing it sideways as it goes. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a plane coming in for the landing at an airport and it looks like they're turned sideways. You ever seen a, a video of a plane landing? And you're thinking, my gosh, they're not going straight, they're going sideways. No, but and that's because they're turned into the wind just so they can keep traveling forwards because the wind's trying to blow them sideways. So what you need to do is take that and turn it this way. He needs to actually fly into the wind a little bit so that he can get an intended trip of due north. And in this case, the plane would be flying in this direction, but it's forward motion plus the sideways motion of the plane make it go like this. So it's those two together. Let's see. This is the, uh, this is the true path and this is the intended path. And this is the wind across there. So you, that's how you add those those vectors together. V, T, the true path, plus the wind will equal the intended path. And you have enough to solve this triangle now. Because it is a closed triangle, so uh, you probably need either law of sines or law of cosines or both. Okay, Mike? Yeah. Help some? Joey? Yeah. Alright. Put these things uh, together. Imagine uh, what would happen if you were in a plane and the wind's blowing the side and you're trying to go straight. You're not going to go straight. You're going to be drifted off to the side. So start putting together with, with what real experience you might have. Whether it's planes or sailboats, they're all kind of the same. All right, so turn that in tomorrow if that'll help. Uh, also, Len, you had a question, and probably others do, because I, I, uh, I can't remember if it showed it on the schedule. Uh, the lab report business, I'm changing a little bit, so no lab reports due tomorrow. Bring with you your projectile motion study stuff. Also, uh, make sure you have access to the previous report the uh, tape drop report because we're going to start putting these reports together. So we'll talk a little bit about the specifics from the projectile motion problem. We did a little bit already in class, but we'll talk some more about it. And then I'll talk some about the specifics of how to start putting a report together that's made up of related but separate parts. And uh, well, we, we have, we, most of us have access to computers in there that start doing some of this writing. Um, so, four weeks have gone by. We got three weeks till spring break. Time is flying by. But when time flies by, it's really easy to get behind. It's very tempting right now, I'm sure, to say, oh, I'll catch up at spring break. You won't. I never did. Stay caught up. It's very hard. Catching up is virtually impossible. So, perps flying by, stay on top of it. All right, any other questions before we get going into new material? All right, what we've been looking at so far is particle kinematics. That's what we've spent four weeks doing. Um, what do I mean by particle? We didn't look at part. We looked at cars and planes and and crates and projectiles. And so what do I mean by particle? Why was that an important designation to us? 
made it a little bit easier because we didn't care about what direction it was facing. It didn't matter if the car was facing forward but driving backwards or any of those type of things. It also made it so we didn't care what size the thing was. We talked a lot about, uh, especially in the first week, uh, a, a, an object going a certain distance. And we didn't have to say, yeah, what do you mean when a car goes a certain distance? Here's my car. What do you mean when a car goes a certain distance when the bumper gets there first, the front bumper gets there before the back bumper gets there? We didn't have to have that kind of argument. We just took it as a particle. We didn't even say what particle of that car represented the car. We just kind of understood that it meant something. Um, if you want to, you can say it's the center of mass of that car. Where the center of mass goes, we'll let that represent the car and let's not worry about the bumpers. Let's not worry about which way it's facing. Let's not worry about any of that kind of stuff. And it does make the problems more straightforward, a little bit easier. They get more complex, the more realistic they get. That shouldn't be any great surprise. That's part of why it takes at least four years to become an engineer. Because we need to take you through steps of increasing realism as your background in both physics and mathematics gets better. That's what we're doing here for four years. I'm in charge of two of it. You'll go somewhere else for the other two. Uh, hopefully only two, maybe more. Um, <clears throat> you can also imagine that we're just back so far that the car just looks like a little dot and then that's all we're concerned with is how fast is it and all those kind of things. So it just makes things uh, uh, so we can get going quickly and we'll add realism to it as we go. Later in the term, uh, we will be very concerned with how big things are, what their size and shape and orientation are, which way are they facing. That will be very important next term. And if you take the follow-on course, uh, in, if you continue in engineering and take a course we call dynamics, uh, we're very concerned with, with uh, that, that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a little bit of a simple simplification, but it gets us going here so we can really start doing some work and then we'll increasingly make it more realistic as we go. What the kinematics mean? That's what we spent four weeks doing. We're, we're, we've learned enough now to go on beyond kinematics now. But what was kinematics? Um, we've been doing it for four weeks. We only learned four things. One thing a week is all I've asked you to learn so far. One thing a week. That's not so much, is it? I bet you have other teachers after you to learn seven or eight things by now. I only asked for four things. What are they? What are the four things we've learned so far? Huh. Whoops. Yeah, it takes a while for things to do something. Yeah, well, uh, velocity, how fast are things moving? And it can take some time for that velocity to change. And we were concerned with that. Position, that's what we started with. Where are these things? And then once we knew they were there, then we saw a little bit later they'd moved. So that's when we brought in velocity. There's three things. What was the fourth thing we learned this term so far? Acceleration, Acceleration of course. That's all we've learned. We learned how to do nothing else but work with those four things, one thing a week. See, now you look back and you think, oh, now I understand why this four weeks has been so relaxed and, and carefree. Now we're going we're gonna to continue with particle. We're still going to be working with particles. Now we're going to work, though, on what's called particle kinetics. That's going to be our concern. Uh, well, both of them are a concern. But we're going to add to it our concern with particle kinetics. Basically, the kinetics is mostly focused on that acceleration piece. Uh, 
doesn't mean we're not going to do with the other ones because they had a lot to do with the acceleration. So the fact that we're going to focus mostly on the acceleration doesn't mean those other three are gone. They're still there. It's just our main focus is going to be on A. Uh, questions like, uh, how do we get A? If I need something to move with a certain acceleration, how do I get that? And I don't care if it's a, a piston in a car engine that I need to accelerate, or the car itself, or the space shuttle, or anything. If I need to get something to accelerate at A, uh, how, what do I do to get that A? I don't want to just guess and hope it accelerates like that and then find out it doesn't and whatever it was I was looking at is I lost. It was accelerated wrong and I lost it. Um, we might also ask how do we prevent A? How do I prevent things from accelerating? That's a pretty important concern. You worry about this. You probably worry, well, you, you, you boys, you live for acceleration, but for women and adults, we're much more concerned with things not accelerating. Because that's what you want bridges to do, is not accelerate. It's pretty spooky, I would bet, if you're on a bridge and it accelerates. A couple years ago, that, that bridge in Minnesota, Remember Accelerated? A couple school buses on it and they dropped into the river and, I don't know, 30, 40 people died because the bridge accelerated. We sometimes, we very often want to prevent acceleration. You're not worried about it specifically right now, but I bet you hope this building doesn't accelerate. Yeah, now you're going to start losing some sleep lying in bed. What if my house accelerates? Mom? Just get on Angel and put it on the discussion board. We'll talk you down. So these are these are the things that we're concerned with. All right. So we'll take that that first one there. How do we prevent A? Well, the the whole business that that we deal with here um, are called Newton's laws. Newton's first law deals with exactly this. How do we prevent A? Well, um, well yeah, he kind of does. Uh, it's sort of in a roundabout way. We're going to be more direct when we get there. This is the one. An object at rest. Sound familiar? Almost anybody out on the street could, could come up with something to the rest of that. An object at rest tends to stay at rest. That's what almost anybody out there could give you. So uh, we'll give them three dots there to, to show our respect for them, the, the people out on the streets. There's more to it than the, just that. Do you know what the rest of it is? An object at rest tends to stay at rest. An object in motion tends to stay in motion. It tends to be a little more specific. Uh, so we can say an object in motion. Now this is where an object in motion tends to stay in motion. That's That's what you'd get from uh, Seventy-five percent of the people out there on the street, and it's just—it's yeah, it's right. It's not as specific enough for us. When we say an object in motion, what we're saying is an object with a certain velocity. <clears throat> Notice that's a velocity vector. I hope that's important to all of us. 
an object in motion, an object moving with velocity v tends to continue to move with that velocity v. And I don't want to write the, the whole thing and I want to go something like that. Tends to, we'll just say tends to keep v. Just to be sort of a shorthand here without being imprecise. All right, let's see. Uh, let's see if we can be a little more concrete with what this means to us. Uh, moving with a velocity vector like that tends to keep that velocity vector. In other words, I could say the velocity vector is constant. Wouldn't that work? Because that means preserve, that to us means preserve both magnitude and direction. We talked about that with uniform circular motion. Magnitude was always the same, but the vector was always changing. And so that, that wouldn't be one of these cases. V, v is a constant. The velocity vector is a constant. If velocity is constant, then then what do I know about the acceleration vector then? Now acceleration vector. See, acceleration vector is the time rate of change of the velocity vector. Time rate of change of a constant is is zero. You said zero, and then I said, you know, it's a vector, and you backed off a of zero. I, I, well, I wish I could play poker with you guys. You're easy marks. So, Newton's first law is in a, a situation of zero acceleration. Well, we've already had that. We've, we've, we've had non-accelerating problems. The issue becomes for us now with the use of Newton's first law, how to ascertain either make sure the acceleration is zero or determine if it will be zero. Either way is the same, same basic, same idea for us. And I think at least one of you already sort of hinted at this, where we were at this. What we do is we look at an object represented by some mass m. So as we talk about objects, we're going to care how massive they are, what their mass is. We haven't worried about that before. We were shooting projectiles and we were spinning things and we were we were accelerating here and there and putting on the brakes, and, but I never once said, how much does that thing weigh? How massive is it? We never once brought that up. We didn't bring that up with objects falling through from, from a height or being shot through the air or any of those things. We didn't look at that. It never came up. Now it will. Now we're going to be concerned with how massive these things weigh. Uh, to accelerate things like masses, you got to push on them. You've got to exert some kind of force on them. And we're going to add up all of those forces. That's why we looked at chapter 2, how to add vectors. Here's the number one reason we're going to add vectors, is because we have to add force vectors. Any problem that has more forces in it than one, we've got to add those forces up. So we haven't talked about forces, but well, we we did a little bit. Remember what I said was the definition of a free fall problem? What did I tell you? Is our, how to determine if a problem is a free fall problem? What did I say? Yeah, the only force is gravity. I just said that. I didn't define force. I didn't talk more about well, what if? 
there are other forces. Didn't look at any of that stuff. Just simply said that the only force is gravity, and everybody was comfortable with it. it it's not that huge a concept, so it was easy to kind of say and sort of toss out there, and, and you guys went with it, and you did great with it. So, what we're going to do is push on with force some object, and that object will accelerate. However, for Newton's first law, I want the acceleration to be zero. So it doesn't even matter what the mass is, but it does tell me how to get zero acceleration. If I want zero acceleration, all of the forces have to sum to zero. For every left going force, I need as much right going force to cancel it. For every up force, I need just as much down force to cancel it. I don't care what directions are involved. After I've added up all of the forces acting on an object, if nothing's left, there'll be no acceleration. If I want to guarantee there's no acceleration, I've got to put on forces such that they all cancel each other. Uh, some people, I like to write that as the sum of the force vectors. Is everybody, everybody familiar with this summation sign? Yeah, it just means you add up everything that's there. So that means we add up all the force vectors. We add up all the force vectors. We, add up, we take into account their direction and their magnitude when we add them together. Uh, some books, and maybe you as well, would rather write F net, the net force. Kind of a business term, like net profits and, and uh, net worth and all that type. It just means after you've summed up everything, what's left. Some books like, to put an R on it, it says resultant. We use that term, I think, in, in chapter two. It's what's what you have when you've added some vectors together. In this case, we want the resultant to be zero. So any of those you write are fine. Um, just some kind of indication that it's several, could be several vectors added together. Sometimes it'll be just one. You can imagine that might be a good place to start. But you can also imagine fairly quickly we'll be working with multiple vectors that, that we'll be doing problems with more than one force vector in it. So, Newton's first law. An object in motion remains in that motion. And by that motion, I could mean it's just sitting there. An object in motion remains in that motion unless acted on upon by unbalanced forces. Well, these are balanced forces because they all sum to zero. Newton's second law. Well, we've already skirted around it here, kind of got it there. It's what if the forces don't balance? Or what if I do need some acceleration? You want to you wanna come to the line in a drag race and say, I don't want any acceleration. Well, maybe you do, because if you just sit right there, you can, you can wink at the girls in the stands where the other guy's down the track and he's way down there. And, Who knows what he even looks like? He might be dreaming and nobody knows. So this is the case, what if we do want some acceleration? How do we get it? What do I do with all of the forces acting on an object such that there's enough left over in the right direction to give me the right acceleration? In fact, it's, it's this form that is used 
actually to define mass. That's where we uh, exert a force on an object, look at its acceleration, the ratio of those two, actually it's not a vector because we can't divide vectors. So let me, well let me do this and I'll put magnitude signs on it. That'll be better, then you don't have to erase. We exert a force on something of known size, measure its acceleration, from that we can figure out its mass. That's actually how they they weigh astronauts in outer space. That's how they could determine how fat my brother-in-law was getting. He said, you're drinking way too much beer, John. Better knock that off. Uh, they, they get on a sled that uh, wiggles back and forth like a spring does. They know the force that's exerting. They can see what, what uh, accelerates, what period it's accelerating, and they can figure out what the mass is from that. That's how they weigh astronauts in outer space figure out what their mass is. He, he, he broke about six of those. So that's, we're going to spend some time here putting forces on objects, making them accelerate. And this works, of course, again, in, in lots of different ways. Uh, if I have a particular acceleration, I've known forces, what should my mass be to make sure that all works? All of those kind of things we're going to do. <coughs> and then uh, Newton's third Newton's third law we'll get to in a second. Well, no, I don't have to. I don't know. Every, most of you know it. I bet. Anybody know? Yeah, Tyler, you got it. Yeah, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, it's, it's, it's not really one that has an equation that goes with it other than um, one thing equals another because it's real straightforward. Well, we'll get to it in a second. Uh, so I'll just put down action and reaction period. If you push on something, it pushes back on you with an equal and opposite force. If I punch you in the nose, you're going to feel that. Most of you wouldn't live through that. Not my punch. But, even so, me punching in the face is going to hurt my hand some. Because your face is going to punch back. In retaliation. All of my fights in my life have been one punch fights. Every time. I always fall down before they can hit me again. Way, there's only one punch. All right, so so we need to look at forces. We need to figure out what kinds of forces there are and how to deal with them. All right, let's see. <coughs> A couple ground rules with forces. These aren't things I made up. These are these are this is the way it is out there in the real world, the natural world. Forces cause changes in motion. That that just sounds kind of like Newton's second law. But there's a real important underlying point here. Forces cause changes in motion. It's not the other way around. Changes in motion do not cause forces. Objects undergoing changes in motion might cause some forces, such as when I punch in the nose with my fist. I'm not going to really do that. The administration told me, stop hitting the students. It used to be a great demonstration. I'd bring everybody up here and punch them in the nose, and they'd say, okay, I get it, I get it. And they'd sit down and they'd tell me, stop doing that. <clears throat> Forces cause changes in motion. The fact that my fist is changing in motion, it's my fist changing in motion that can cause forces or have forces caused on it. 
Uh, we'll come across that again in, in more specific ways in a, in, in a bit as we start going through these problems more. All forces. How many? All. I didn't say some or a few or most. I said all. All forces are caused by something real. Something tangible. Something that you can put your hand on. As we go through these problems, and we start lining up all the forces in the problem, we're not going to know all of them without thinking about it some. And so every time we put a force up there, I can say to you, really, what causes that force? And if you don't tell me something real, like the earth, or a rope, or uh, uh, a jet engine, if you can't tell me something real, I'm not going to accept that as a force that we can put up on this problem. Forces are not caused by motion. Motion exists, but it's not something you can put your hand on. It's not something tangible. We can study motion, we can cause motion with forces, but you can't go put your hand on velocity. You can't go put your hand on acceleration. So that's what I mean when I say forces are caused by something real. I'm going to ask you when you say put that force up there and say what causes it. And if you can't give me a good answer, it's not going up on the drawing. Not going in the problem. If that's not my picky rule. That's God. He did that. As we go through this, we are concerned with forces on objects. We know from action-reaction pair that if there's a force on the object, the object is causing a force back on something else. We're not concerned with that force. It's not part of the problem doing the accelerating. We will need this at time to find certain forces, but when we're accelerating a mass, we're concerned with the forces acting on that mass. All right, all of this will become more apparent as we work through it some. All right, I want to leave those up. Need a little space here. Hope everybody got those. If not, videos are on sale in the lobby. All right, we'll do a simple problem here. This is my rocket ship. Man, it's a beauty. Awesome rocket like that. Samantha, what's a rocket sound like? Yeah, see, girls can't make cool noises like that. Can't do truck noises, can't do gun noises. Do you? Oh, when you drive? when nobody else is around to hear them. Yeah. See, I think I think they should use that as the uh, gender test at the Olympics. You know, they have to determine if women really are women in the Olympics. They sh yeah, they do that. They used to do it by DNA, but then the South, South, South African woman had some odd results or something in the DNA, so even that wasn't working. And then gender transfer people were trying to get in the Olympics now. I think they just ask them to make a, make a gun noise. <laughs> Can't do it, you're a woman. That's what I say. And that's on tape.
<laughs> in case you want to press charges in there. <laughs> Now's your chance. All right, so here we go. My rocket has a mass of 20,000 kilograms. Uh, it's not uncommon in physics and engineering and the like to leave a space where a comma would be because in a lot of European countries, a comma is a decimal and a decimal is a comma. And so they might think it's 20 kilograms, which is really a tiny rocket and it's just not worth it. Thrust is three times 10 to the fifth newtons. Oh, hey, that, that's going to need defining right there. F equals MA. If I accelerate a one kilogram mass, that's uh, that's about a, a liter bottle of, of water, I think. If I accelerate a one kilogram mass at the rate of one meter per second squared, I got one kilogram mass and I want to accelerate it one meter per second squared. To do so would require a force of such a size that we'll call that force a Newton. So there's, there's our definition. That's what three bars means. We define one Newton as one kilogram. It's, it's a purely artificial. We could have picked any other numbers there. Remember what I told you the first day in the, in the uh, SI system. The kilogram, the meter, and the second are all predefined. So we take those, the fundamental one each, and we'll call that a Newton. It's an honorary um, artificial convenience. That's the only purpose in it. So instead of writing one kilogram meter per second squared, we save a little bit of trouble and write a new one in. Just convenience. Internationally recognized, but merely a convenience. It actually does a couple things for us. One is it's convenient, it's easier to write N instead of all that stuff. Uh, it also allows us to honor a dead white male German physicist, because we like to do that. So if you're not dead, white, male, or German, we'll never, never name anything after you. You have to be a dead white male German physicist. So that's one new. Uh, oh, by the way, if units are ever written out, which they almost never are, but if for some silly reason you wanted to write the, new, the units out, it's no longer capitalized. It's not his name there. It's a unit, and we don't capitalize units. We might capitalize them here because then it's in honor of someone. So as you write your report, get the units written in the right way. Uh, almost never would we spell them out, so don't even bother. Again, save some trouble. All right, so that's a Newton. So I've given you the mass. We want to find out how fast this rocket's going to accelerate. Now, here's what we need to do. We need to make what is called a three-body diagram.
the better you get at drawing these, the easier these problems will be for you. If you're lazy and sloppy with them, they're not only going to not help you, they'll probably hurt you in certain instances. I've seen it happen. I've had it happen to me when I was lazy with it. We take the object of interest, which in this case is a rocket ship. We're trying to accelerate it. We want to figure out what that acceleration is. We try to take the object of interest, the body, draw it free of anything else in the problem. No, no, no exhaust cloud. No, I didn't even bother with the fins, though they got to be accelerated too. But it just, I want to make it real simple and real useful. Free of anything else in the problem. I don't have the ground. I don't have the gantry tower. I don't have mission control. I don't have any of that. It's just, uh, just uh, the object, the body we're trying to work with. Uh, two key words drawing free body diagrams. Make them big. If they're too small, Again, not only will they not help, they might hurt. You're not working for the post office here. You're trying to get as much stuff right as you can. So make them big. Also, make them simple. I didn't need the fins on here. I don't need the windows. I don't need the, the, the USA flag on the side of it. Make them simple. We have a lot more stuff we need to do with these diagrams and anything else is going to get in the way of making those diagrams useful for us. These are This is one of the number one tools to help us solve kinetics problems. It's going to be especially true for those of you going into engineering that will be with me next year in statics and following that in uh, strength of materials and or dynamics. Big and simple. Think football player. Big and simple. Were you a football player? Was. Yeah? Were you big and simple then? Yeah, I see you were. Yeah, kinda. Yeah? Mike, football player? Big and simple. Samantha, do you mean any football players that weren't big and simple? Pretty much all of them, isn't it? Pretty much. Yeah, but he's not really a football player. He's really a soccer player sold out. <laughs> All right. Make them big. Simple. Beautiful. Man, some people need to take technical freehand sketching. <laughs> not too big, because we might need to put some stuff below it. Sometimes you got to be prepared ahead of time. Go ahead and flip the page. Make them big. Simple. All right. Now, what we put on that diagram is nothing more than all of the forces in the problem. To accelerate that mass, we need to know what forces are on it. So, let's see. Uh, well, you help me. Any forces on that? Gravity, uh, or what we call the weight. Now, the weight is going to be pretty easy for us to figure out. Because we always do it in just the same way. In fact, it's a form of F equals MA. The force due to gravity, which we call weight, is equal to the mass of the object times the gravitational field strength, or what we often call the acceleration due to gravity. But an object has weight even if it's not accelerating. So just because we're using g there doesn't mean it's moving with acceleration g. 
It just means that's how strong the earth is pulling on it. If you take physics three, you'll learn about field strength and you'll see how that's uh, known more precisely as a field strength rather than as an acceleration. Because things that aren't, you're not accelerating right now, but you all have weight. Well, Samantha doesn't, but the rest of you do. So we've got some, so we've got, we've got this. We've got 20,000 kilograms. What's G? Oh, we did uh, two labs on it. Okay, 9.81 meters per second squared. Oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. Shouldn't there be a minus sign in here? Oh, I heard some no's, I heard some yeses, I had some blank stares. Gravity, look, it's acting down. Shouldn't this have a negative sign in? Something else. Like down is negative, so positive or negative. Nope. It's not up to you. No. Nope. Sorry? G is always positive. Yeah, it has direction, and we may need to assign the negative to that direction. But there's no direction in here. This is just calculating. If I had a negative sign in there, there'd be a negative weight. Who's ever gone to the doctor and got, he asked you what your weight is, and you said, oh, my weight's a negative, negative 240. What, Len? Is that what you were about what you were guessing for me? Yeah, well, maybe a little less. Maybe a little less. A little bit. Weight is the strength of the Earth's pull on us. It always is down. We may need to assign a negative to it when we get to the rest of the problem, but as it is here, there is no negative sign in it. G itself never has a negative sign built in. We may have to put one on, but that's artificial and that's personal choice, and we haven't even made any choice like that yet. Any other forces on this rocket ship, this M? Well, you can look at this problem and tell there's got to be. Because right now, with only a force pulling it down, that's all it's going to do is go down. There's got to be something pushing it up for it to accelerate up. What? Huh. I thought it was, see, wow, he's a ventriloquist. And I didn't even see his mouth move. Twice he said it. Yeah, the, there's got to be, well, that's what the thrust does, is it pushes up on rockets. So I'll just draw it there. I'll call it T for thrust. Wait a second. Isn't all this stuff shooting out the back? Isn't that thrust? Now that's the exhaust shooting out the back. That's not the rocket itself being thrown forward. We'll, we'll see why a rocket engine has to shoot some stuff out of the back later. We'll, we'll talk specifically about that. Any other forces on this problem? Because until we've got all the forces in a problem, there's no sense summing them together. If we're summing together the wrong number, we're not doing the right problem. Any other forces? Air resistance. There could be air resistance. Of, of course, for something like the space shuttle, that's a huge factor. A huge factor. However, air resistance, well, one, we often neglect it. Remember all those projectile problems? What was always said? Neglecting air resistance. It's a problem that you're not ready to tackle yet. You'll need a course called differential equations. Actually, uh, later in the term for the third part of the big report, we'll do an estimate of air resistance, the effect of air resistance. 
but we can only estimate it. Uh, when you take differential equations, you'll be able to solve this problem. It's because the force of air resistance depends upon the speed of the object. But the speed of the object depends upon the forces on it, because that determines the acceleration. But the forces depends upon the speed, and the speed depends upon the forces, and the sport didn't round and round. So that's why you can't solve it yet. That's why you need a course called differential equations, when you can solve those things that are intertwined like that. So we'll do either one of two things. We'll just say neglecting air resistance. Or we'll assume we're right at launch and it's not moving yet. Things can have acceleration, but no velocity yet. Isn't that right? The, accel the, the thrust is turned on. It's starting to accelerate, but it hasn't accelerated young, long enough to actually have any velocity yet. So that means the air resistance is essentially zero. So. We've got all the forces in this problem. Now we can do something like, let's say, up is positive. If you don't want to, don't. Say it's negative. Uh, that's entirely up to you. And now we sum all of the forces acting on the mass. We can determine its acceleration. So, sum of forces, uh, it's a vector, but we're only moving in the y direction, so let's only sum the y direction business. There's nothing going on in the x direction. It's all zero. All of the forces in the y direction. T is positive. I happen to choose that. You might want to choose something else. I don't care. W is down. It's negative. Notice I didn't do that back here. I did that here, and that was my choice. I didn't even ask you. We didn't even consult on that. Sum all the forces in the y direction. Well, that's all there is. That's going to cause that mass to accelerate. And it's that acceleration we're looking for. What is it, its weight? Did anybody come up with that? 196,200. 196,200. Nope. All right, so we've got everything now we need. A equals T minus W over M, and now you just fill the pieces in, and and you got them all. You're laughing. It's that easy. So let's see. T, that's the thrust, remember, is... 3 times 10 to the 5th Newtons minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1.96 times 10 to the 5th. Over 20,000 kilograms. Does that give us units of acceleration? If not, we screwed up. No really sense even going to the calculator if we screwed up. Check your units. Does that give us units of acceleration? A newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. We're dividing by kilograms, so we have meters per second squared left, so we're okay. What's it equal? Who's got it there? 5.19. 5.19 meters per second squared. Straightforward, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> 
be careful with this. Uh, problems are going to get a little more complicated. We'll be moving to two-dimensional problems shortly. Um, one other thing that is kind of subtle and students forget it that I want to point out. Oh, actually, two things we'll, we'll do. Oh, we got some time. We're okay. <coughs> Whether or not there's acceleration, whether or not the problems, the forces sum to zero, that's our working equation for now. One thing I want you to notice about it. Mass is always positive. There's no such thing as negative mass, at least not in this class. There is antimatter and some other things we could consider in physics 4. But in our class, mass is always a positive quantity. Therefore, because it's a positive quantity, and this is important, it's subtle and important. Therefore, the sum of the forces, after we add all the forces up, whatever's left over might be a single, something we could represent with a single force. Remember, one of the things we could do is write it like that. Therefore, the sum of the forces is, and I'm going to leave a little space, because I don't know what to put in there. What could I put in there? Therefore, the sum of the resultant force is something to the acceleration. Uh, equal and opposite. Um, parallel to. Uh, perpendicular to, um, what other possibility? Oblique to, that's such a great word. Um, any other possible, huh? Equal to, just simply equal to, greater than, less than, not equal to, the inverse of. What do I put here? Well, we know it's proportional to because there's a proportionality constant right there. But I want to be I want to be more complete. These are two different vectors. This will help us get the magnitude of the vectors. I'm asking really, what's the deal with the direction of those two vectors? If I sum up all the forces and have a net force left over, in what direction will the acceleration be? Same. Since this is positive, it's not going to do anything to the direction. Is some of the forces is, what would I say? Uh, I guess parallel to, but not only parallel to, parallel and collinear. Even that's not enough. Because uh, you you go south on the north way, the people going north on the north way are going parallel to you and collinear, well not collinear, then they'd be in your lane. That'd be terrible. Uh, in the same direction. That's very useful. Obvious in a simple problem like this, it'll be very useful in problems that aren't so simple, aren't so obvious. Uh, we had 300,000 newtons pushing up, 200,000 pushing down, so our net force is about 3,000 up, 2,000 up, about 100,000. Is that right? 
up because I had an up force and a down force. The down force was less. The weight was trying to hold it down. So I know the direction of the resultant force. I also know the acceleration. They're parallel in the same direction. Actually, it'd be collinear. I'd, I'd technically, I'd write them over each other. Um, but then you couldn't see them. All right, questions. Wednesday, we'll talk about what kind of forces there are in these problems and how they act because we need to get them all on this drawing in just the right way. They won't all be as easy as this one is. So you can bring your homework tomorrow if you wish. Wait, not bring it tomorrow if you wish. I guess. It's your choice.